Strategy of History by Lawrence Friedman, Oxford Press, 2013 Annihilation or Exhaustion At the start of the 20th century, the military historian Hans Delbruck argued that all military strategy could be divided into two basic forms. The first, conforming to the majority view of the day, was Niederwerfungsstrategie, the strategy of annihilation, which demanded a decisive battle to eliminate the enemy's army. The second drew on Clausewitz's note of 1827, which recognized the possibility for another type of war when the available means could not deliver a decisive battle. This Delbruck described as Ermatungsstrategie, the strategy of exhaustion, sometimes translated as attrition. Whereas with the strategy of annihilation there was just one pole to battle, with exhaustion there was another pole, involving a variety of ways to achieve the political ends of war, including occupying territory, destroying crops, and blockading. In the past, these alternative approaches for want of better options had often been used and could be effective. What was important was to be flexible when deciding upon a strategy, to attend to the political realities of the time, and to not rely on a military strategy that might be beyond practical capacity. Delbruck did not intend to imply that the strongest was bound to be attracted by annihilation, whereas the weak were fated to do what they could through an exhaustion. Exhaustion was not about a single decisive battle, but about an extended campaign that would wear the enemy out. He mocked the idea of a pure maneuver strategy that allows war to be conducted without bloodshed. There was always a possibility of battle. His view of a strategy of exhaustion was more operational than an anticipation of the later uh, concept of attritional war. This placed more emphasis on how underlying economic, industrial, and demographic factors would sustain warfare. Delbruck's analysis led him into furious arguments with historians of the German general staff, especially when Delbruck argued that Frederick the Great had practiced limited war rather than decisive battle. The history was on his side in that Frederick had become wary of battle and careful in his ambition, but there was still a problem with the dichotomous presentation of complex options. The problem was to suggest that a fundamental choice had to be made in advance about how to comport an army for a coming war, a tendency that remained evident in strategic debate over the coming century. The challenge for Delbruck at this time, however, was to get German generals to contemplate anything other than a swift offensive leading to the annihilation of the enemy army in a, de in a decisive battle. The complex relationship between theory and practice and strategy was revealed by the American Civil War. At one level, the outcome of the war was the result of the North enjoying twice the population and far greater industrial strength than the South. For much of the war, the Confederacy could claim more imaginative generals. At the weaker side, as the weaker side, it might have been tempted to rely on defensive tactics, but instead often took the military initiative, perhaps in the hope that the North would respect the outcome of a truly decisive battle. President Lincoln saw clearly that the Union strategy required an offensive, but to his exasperation, his generals seemed to be unable to mount one successfully until quite late in the war. Clausewitz had no discernible influence on these events. That was not so with Yomini. The lead, leading teacher at West Point, Dennis Mahan, had spent time in France studying the Napoleonic Wars and was an avowed Yominian, while his star pupil, Henry Old Brains Halleck, who became President Lincoln's general-in-chief, had gone so far as to translate Yomini's Life of Napoleon into English. Mahan celebrated Napoleon's military art, quote, by which an enemy is broken and utterly dispersed by one and the same blow. No futilities of preparation, no uncertain feeling about uh, in search of a key point, no hesitancy upon the decisive moment, the whole field of view taken in by one eagle glance. What could not be seen divined by an unerring instinct, clouds of light troops thrown forward to bewilder his foe, a crashing fire of cannon and mass opened upon him, the rush of the, the impetuous column into the gaps made by the artillery, the overwhelming charge of the restless cuirassier, followed by the lancer and the hussar, to sweep up the broken dispersed bands. Such were the tactical lessons taught in almost every battle of this great military period." End quote. Halleck was a senior general at the start of the war and soon became general-in-chief. His specialty as an engineer, however, was fortification, and that gave him a regard for defenses that was never wholly in keeping with Mahan's call for vigor on the field and rapidity of pursuit.
a combination of expertise in defensive methods, including digging trenches and deadly rifle, rifled muskets, was bound to inhibit frontal assaults. This caution was also evident in the Union's first general-in-chief, George McClellan. Yomini's influence among the generals is evident in their focus on lines of communication and their opposition to Lincoln's proposals to mount a series of concurrent attacks against the South, including coastal operations. This they judged to be an affront to the principles of war, as it would require divided forces. It was just the sort of proposal to be expected from an untutored civilian. Lincoln, who never doubted that this would be a long, wearing battle, was reluctant to press his own views, but was ready to replace his generals in the hopes of finding someone who would take the fight to the enemy. The generals were wary of the defense's potential and were so enamored with the idea of a decisive battle that they were reluctant to risk their forces in anything else. As General McClellan put it, quote, I do not wish to waste life in useless battles, but prefer to strike at the heart, end quote. Lincoln became increasingly frustrated by a preference for maneuvers over assaults. This he described disparagingly as strategy. That's the word, strategy, he claimed. He exclaimed in 1862, General McClellan thinks he's going to whip the rebels by strategy. It described a form of warfare that did everything with an army but fight. Feints, maneuvers, and other clever moves might win the occasional battle, but it was brute force, relentlessly applied, that made the difference. When the South was eventually penetrated, exposing the limits of the Confederacy's defenses, Lincoln was prepared to accept the benefits. Now, gentlemen, that is true strategy, because the enemy was diverted from his purpose. Robert E. Lee of the Confederacy had made his own studies of Napoleon and was totally convinced of the need to go on the offensive to annihilate enemy forces. He knew that he could not mount a successful passive defense and so had to take the initiative, using maneuvers to get into the best position but then accepting battle. But this involved high casualties and the Union side did at least understand defenses. Lee had set a goal for victory that he could not realize and he suffered the consequences. The rival armies were too big, too resilient, too thoroughly sustained by the will of democratic governments to be destroyed in a single Napoleonic battle. Ulysses Grant saw the logic clearly and brutally. The terrible loss of life in both armies had achieved little, observed Grant but he understood that the North could survive the losses better than the South, and so he decided to embark on, quote, as desperate fighting as the world has ever witnessed, end quote, locking Lee's forces in constant combat until he barely had an army left. Meanwhile, Grant sent General Sherman to make life miserable for the people of the South, bringing home the costs of the war and make it harder to sustain an army in the field. Lincoln's own contribution was to press ahead in January 1863 with the Emancipation Proclamation that freed slaves in the areas under rebellion, a move described as a necessary war measure for suppressing said rebellion. This not only further unsettled the South, but reinforced the Union Army. By 1865, former slaves counted for 10% of its army. In the end, this was a war of exhaustion. The leader of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis, observed how the war's magnitude had, had exceeded his expectations. Quote, the enemy have displayed more power and energy and resources than I had attributed to them. Their finances have held out far better than I imagined would be the case. It is not possible that a war of the dimensions that this one has assumed of proportions so gigantic can be very long protracted. The combatants must soon be exhausted.